um, from different ages, different points of view, so um, if that makes sense. You get different perspectives on her. Um, she's a very troubled character. I, she suffers a lot. I make my characters suffer a lot. <laughs> well, the reader doesn't suffer <laughs> reading it. Um, so Maya, did you want to tell us a bit about your, you've got the three different yes, time frames? Yes, I have three different main characters in the history of Beast. Um, the first one, the first story is set in England in 1852 and we meet, uh, we meet William, he's a biologist and he's sort of depressed when the story starts because he feel, feels he hasn't really done anything in his life. Um, and the second story, uh, yeah, I, I have to say one more thing about him. He, he then gets sort of, he gets out of bed because he decides to invent a whole new type of beehive. So that's his story. This is also a story about beekeeping. And the second story is about George. Uh, he lives in Ohio in 2007 and he is a beekeeper. Mm -hmm. And around him, uh, other beekeepers are starting to... Um, lose their bees because as you might know bees die all over the globe and 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 the, we have something called the colony collapse disorder and it started and it got its name in 2007 in the united states and the third story is about a chinese uh, woman living in the Sichuan province in in 2098 and the old bees and the pollinating insects have disappeared and she's actually working as a hand pollinator um, and her name is Tao. So yeah, it's three very different voices and very different characters and but they, they have the bees uh, in common. They do. I look forward to coming back and you know asking more about each of them. Cora, you've got a, a big cast of characters really in your book. Yeah, the story opens in the not very distant future in a time of uh, economic and environmental crisis and uh, the point of view character is a young man who's mostly called Hubert etc in the book. He's got uh, 20 first names. His parents were members of the anonymous party and, but quit in a fury when they instituted a real names policy and named him after the top 20 names in the 1890 census as an act of petty revenge. Uh, <laughs> He had been a, a member of a, a sort of precariat. He was part of a huge investment bubble in building Zeppelins, because science fiction is always better with Zeppelins. But like all bubbles, that burst, and so now he's become a member of the Unnecessariat. And he's gone along to an illegal rave in a factory that these um, uh, kind of anarchist ravers are rebooting, this factory that's been mothballed. And they're, they're rebooting it, opening it up, and, and making things that they're giving away, making the products of the factory. They call it a communist party, but they're not communists. They, they say being a, going to a communist party doesn't make you a communist any more than going to a birthday party makes you a birthdayist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he becomes acquainted with a young woman who uh, is uh, the scion of a very wealthy family. She's sort of playing it bohemian. And he and his best mate and this woman, after a series of crises, uh, drop out and move into uh, the bush where uh, in brownfield sites that have been left devastated by uh, environmental collapse, um, people who have been pushed out of society are using stolen software to build drones that loot uh, ruins for the materials necessary to build giant luxury resorts that anyone's allowed to live in. Uh, and that's all going tickety-boo until they run into some scientists who've uh, stolen the secret of immortality from the super rich to whom they were beholden and brought it to the rest of us, uh, which turns this kind of cute bohemia into an existential threat to the super wealthy who realize that, yes, they may get to live forever, but we'll be there too. <laughs> there are a lot of ideas in this novel, as you can tell. Um, Corey, um, still on yours, um, you, you cover quite a time span as well, and it's not necessarily um, you know, we don't follow them the whole time. But what was behind the choice to show, it's, it's sort of in the future, but then you, you're showing quite an expanse of the, these characters' lives and them coming in, in and out of each other's lives. Why did you choose to show such a, a long part of their lives? Well, it's a novel about radical politics, and radical politics consists of an enormous number of very tedious meetings. And uh, a little bit of that goes a long way. And so I reckon that if you included enough tedious meetings that people get the idea, followed by the crisis that the tedious meetings were all about averting or precipitating, 
followed by an ellipsis, followed by some tedious meetings that represent the new state of things, followed by the crisis, that that, that, that moves things along at a reasonable clip, that no one wants to, uh, Robert's rules of order are a great way to run a meeting, but a terrible way to structure a novel. <laughs> Uh, Maya, so the, of course what joins the three sections and the three characters um, is bees. Um, could you talk a bit about the choice of those three eras in particular and why you wanted to focus on those, what was happening then? Well, the novel really started with three questions. Um, I, I, it actually started when I saw a documentary about colony collapse disorder and about the importance of bees for everything we eat almost. Uh, and then I got three questions in my head and the first was why are the bees dying and disappearing and to find out I had to go back in time to the start of modern beekeeping and modern agriculture uh, so that's where that's where William's story started and his story is also uh, very much inspired by um, uh, the person who is called the father of modern beekeeping which is called uh, his name was Lorenzo Langstroth so I sort of looked into his story as well when I wrote it uh, he was depressed and Beast gave him sort of uh, meaning um, uh, and purpose to his life again. Uh, and, and the second question was, how does it really feel to lose your, your beast, when, when, to lose your work, to lose your life? And when I, I did a lot of research when I wrote this novel because I wanted it to be as accurate. Even though it's fiction, I wanted it to be accurate. So I, I, I saw a lot of documentaries about beekeepers in, in the United States in 2007 and they were sort of uh, hard-working men, always men, uh, uh, strong uh, but devastated, uh, standing over their empty beehives and you could see the tears in their eyes uh, but they didn't have the words for their sorrow. So there you have George. Mm. Um, they gave me the idea uh, of how to, to write him. And he's a man of few words, but yeah. still he's... And he's very bad at communicating with his, his son, especially. Uh, this is also very much a story about parents and children, which very I can talk more, so, yeah. more about later. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the last question was, um, how will the world look without pollinating insects? And I, I never really thought of myself as um, uh, a novelist writing from the future. So I, I sort of had to dive into it still because the question demanded it and the story demanded it. Um, and, and there we meet Tao who lives in a world where there has been a collapse and, and the bees have all gone. Um, but it's... Her story is also very much a story about a mother and her young child. And, and at, so, at some time in the story, she lose, she, he's taken away from her. So it's also a story about her trying to find back to her son. Yeah. Um, and it was, for me, it was looking at the story uh, as not the future story or not a dystopian story, but the story about a mother and her three-year-old son. Um, and I had a three-year-old son when I wrote it, so it is also very much as, uh, comes from my own heart, you know. Yeah, and the characters um, really make it so compelling. I mean, the information is, of course, fascinating and something that, you know, we need to be thinking about, but, yeah, the characters really draw you in and move you. Um, Jen, the sort of central, I guess, event of your novel is the ocean receding. Is receding the right word? Go. Yeah, receding, disappearing, disappearing, abandoning the land. Yeah, which we find out pretty early on in the novel. It's in chapter two, it's not that yeah. much of a spoiler. Yeah, but the structure of the, the novel is very um, non-linear and in a, in a deliberate kind of way. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, well I don't actually know how that started, but um, I was sort of speculating. I set out to write a kind of comedy about capitalism and it turned out it wasn't very funny, but um, <laughs> I ended up thinking a lot about climate change and where we're headed and how screwed up that is um, from the point of view of a sort of a small town. And rather than um, rather than write about what I think the actual future is going to be like, I wanted to talk a little bit more at a meta level about what why we imagine the future, why we need to imagine the future, why capitalism so obsessed with 
uh, promising us a better future rather than making the present any good for most of the people that live on this planet. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't actually remember where the idea of the sea receding came from, but if you've been to like Port Germain at low tide, maybe it's there. Um, it was sort of a deliberate, uh, a deliberate way to angle, because we all know the sea's rising, right? So it was a deliberate way to clue the reader into the idea that this is not actually itself a prediction of the future. This is a game about what the future is, what the future really means to us. Um, so the sea receding actually happens towards the end of, or towards the middle of the story, but it's at the start of the book. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that the, the timelines are really interspersed with each other. Um, it's really difficult to talk about the structure of this book because it was such an architectural nightmare to put together. <laughs> but also because um, I think one of the reasons that I had to break the linear narrative was that uh, because Sam can predict the future, Sam can see the future. And once you have someone with prescience in a story, uh, then you've, you've screwed yourself. You've lost causality, which is like the root of all narrative. So, Actually, I went back to um, Greek tragedy, where you have these inevitable endings and you know the story's going to go badly. And so I wanted to look at um, playing with structure in a way that, um, you know, gives, gives things away but not all at once, if that makes any sense. So you've got the other kind of narration, which is the town. It's, it's like yeah, the people so of the town. Yeah, so going back to Greek tragedy yeah. led me to use a chorus. So the town of Clapston speaks as a chorus throughout the novel um, in this first person plural, which um, I, I do a lot of editing and I often find um, first person plural to be quite irritating. So it was a huge challenge for me to write from that perspective and not make it irritating. I still wanted it to feel like an authentic voice. Um, but that was also a, a way of talking about a collective, um, how a collective can deal with, or fail to deal in this case, with uh, catastrophic change and with also the small changes that come through a community, um, through a town. So they're kind of fucked over by industry. This is a familiar South Australian story. The local industry closes down, the town loses its direction and they're uh, looking out for what's next. Um, at which point they're open to being exploited. Yeah, this, this does lead me on to what I wanted to ask next. Um, there's a line in the book, um, it's surprising how fast you get used to things. And I wanted to ask you all about the idea of people adapting to change um, in your books. Um, I guess there's also, um, for your main character, Sam, um, adapting to knowing about change like yeah, and adapting to being like a non-neurotypical human being as well in a context where that's not really respected um and so there's all these different angles from which she's seen from the medical angle and um her mother finds her quite frustrating she's got a hard-working single mom um but yeah i think that that idea of adaptation and the idea of like getting used to things is very present in this book um and it's partly because I feel like we talk about climate change as if it's something that's happening in the future, but it's not. It's happening now. We're already in it. We're seeing it all the time, like, everywhere you look. We're already living with one degree of warming. And I wanted to sort of look at this, this notion of how we sort of construct the idea of normal. So the sea retreats from the town, and this is a, an extravagant gesture on my part, but the townsfolk become used to it quite And quickly. there's a very bad smell. Yeah, yeah it but rots. They, yeah. There's a rotting animals everywhere. It's terrible. Yeah, but they become, yeah, you describe a lot how they become used to the smell. People have told me it's a very olfactory novel. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Um, Corey, what about your characters and this sort of notion of adapting? I'm, I think, I'm thinking a little bit about this sim, that, you know, the way they can kind of upload themselves. Um, I guess technology is an area that you're very interested in. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think that... Um, with respect to the future, that science fiction, thankfully, is not a predictive literature. Uh, you know, I think it, it scores about as well as you'd expect if you were throwing darts. But that what science fiction does do extremely well is diagnose our, our anxieties and uh, aspirations about technology. So when you uh, 
when you look at what a writer has written, you find out, you find out what they are hoping for, or what they're fearful of. When you look at what people are reading, you find out what's on our collective mind in this moment. And since the present is the standing wave, where the past becomes the future, you, you find out something about the future, but not not in a predictive way, but rather in a way that lets you. Um, uh, maybe make a diagnosis and try to intervene in the future. The future is contestable, not, not preordained. And so by having more diagnostic information about the present, you can look into the future. These characters in, in, in Walk Away, they achieve a kind of odd immortality in that they, um, they find a way to make very high resolution images of their brains. Um, and then they use a kind of trial and error using unimaginably vast computers to see if they can get those brains to do something that seems like it's waking up. Uh, but one of the things that they discover very quickly is that uh, something that has reasonably high fidelity to you that wakes up in a computer might be somewhat distressed at the fact, especially if the reason that they've woken up inside a computer is that you are dead. This is a, a distressing realization to come to. But thankfully, they have a lot of computer power. And so within the constraints of all the things that you might think, they try to chart a path to the very unlikely but still possible thoughts you might have in which realizing that you're dead and, and living on as a computer program wouldn't distress you unduly. Mm -hmm. And so they, they think, they sort of try to go two or three hops ahead. If I think this, then what? And if I think that, then what? And then I think that, then what? And the ones that end in a, in a kind of meltdown, they just prune away. They try to thread this very, very fine path through all the possible yous you could be into the one that is well adapted to being dead and, and, and simulated in software. Mm -hmm. It works with differing degrees of success. And um, one of the things that they come to realize is that not everyone is capable, not everyone has a state in which they, they are amenable to being in software. And those people may never be software people. Uh, and then at a certain point, the software people who of course can be multifarious, they can make more than one copy of themselves, um, and they, they start to go everywhere to appear as kind of house spirits in different computers in different places during this moment of great upheaval that involves everything from Hellfire missiles to tank battles to Zeppelin battles to no-knock entry warrants by temporal authorities and so on, they, they realize that they can, they can be the last person out of a, of a, of a place where their comrades are, who are still dressed in meat are escaping, and uh, that when it's all over, they can take the safeties off and they can live the hysteria that's been at the edges of their lives ever since they woke up. And that they can record this and share it with everyone else who's like them just before they wink out of existence. And it becomes a kind of recreational drug for them. And you do have one character who turns out not to be dead and you know, meets, there's yeah. a, a meat, meat person meeting a computer person. Someone, so. someone who, who was believed to have been dead, but in fact had been uh, rendered to a secret prison for 14 years, who when she participates in a uh, uh, takeover of the prison by the prisoners after the private prison company that runs it collapses and leaves them there, um, and then rediscovers her old comrades, uh, discovers that her comrades having mistaken her for dead have been living with a version of her in software for a decade and a half whom she, uh, she has some awkward interactions with. Mm -hmm. um, Maya, in terms of the idea of um, adaptation, um, in the future section of your novel, Tao works to pollinate trees, as you mentioned. Can you talk about the w this way um, humans have adapted to the issue of bees dying out? What, did you, is that something that you researched? I, I, yes, I researched that as well, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, do you want me to read now? If you like. Yes. Yeah, that's, yes, the, that's the beginning, first, isn't it? The beginning, yeah. because that's here. Sounds great. <laughs> yes. Okay, sorry, English is not my first language, as you probably already heard, so pardon it for not being perfect, but I'll try my best. Tao, District 242, Shirong, Sichuan, 2098. Like oversized birds, we balanced on our respective branches, each of us with a plastic container in one hand and a feather brush in the other. I climbed upwards very slowly, as carefully as I could. I was not cut out for this, wasn't like many of the other women on the crew. My movements were often too heavy-handed. 
I lacked the subtle motor skills and precision required. This wasn't what I was made for, but all the same, I had to be here every single day, 12 hours a day. The trees were old as a lifetime, the branches were as fragile as thin glass, they cracked beneath our weight. I twisted myself carefully, mustn't damage the tree. I placed my right foot on a branch even further up and carefully pulled the left up behind it. And finally I found a secure working position, a comfortable but stable. From here I could reach the uppermost flowers. The little plastic container was full of the gossamer gold, carefully weighed out. I tried to transfer invisible portions lightly out of the container and over into the trees. Each individual blossom was to be dusted with a tiny brush of hen feathers. From hens, scientifically cultivated for precisely this purpose. No feathers of artificial fibers had proven nearly as effective. It had been tested and tested again because we had had plenty of time. In my district, the tradition of hand pollination was more than a hundred years old. The bees here had disappeared back in the 1980s, long before the collapse. Pesticides had done away with them. And this is a fact. <laughs> um, in China, in the Sichuan uh, district, uh, the bees disappeared in the 1980s and they started to hand pollinate. Uh, and these are used in the story, so if you google hand pollination Sichuan, you will find some a lot of pictures and probably uh, films as well where you see it and it's a beautiful and, and also kind of scary um, thing to see I think it's, it's people trying to overcome or trying to do what nature should do maybe um, and and this I used in the story. That's why the story is that that is why the future part is put in China because they already do this today. The bees has have come back, uh, but they still hand pollinate because it is proven more uh, effective. So so yes. And when I worked with the novel, I used a lot of um, facts like this to to uh, and got, got my inspiration from it really. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, with all of you in terms of the, the building of these future worlds, um, I guess how sort of far reaching was your research or did you sort of draw from things that are, you're generally interested in anyway? Because I know all of you in some way are sort of engaged with issues of the future um, in your other writing or my, your next book as well. Um, so yeah, if you could talk a bit about the, the research or what you sort of drew on from your own interests and knowledge in regards to this, Jen? Uh, yeah, I made it up. Um, <laughs> this book was really visual for me, it sort of um, started as a series of uh, hallucinations or dreams or something and so it was sort of a matter of piecing together these weird subconscious um, pictures more than anything. I don't, I didn't really go into any kind of technology actually. I don't really think about this book as being particularly futuristic. I think it's more of a tilted now than a future. If it is the future it's very very near, um, if that helps. So I mostly just made it up. So it's the I don't know, I'm thinking about the character of Sam and how she is feeling pressure as an individual, it's like a, a responsibility, I guess, mm -hmm. um, and then there are these other forces that are outside her control, so do you see that as being more of a, yeah, a contemporary thing than the future? I think it's a, um, the, the crisis in this book is really a mother-daughter crisis mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, and I think that's one thing that I noticed in both of your books as well, that there's this parent-child conflict at the yeah. heart of it. And for me, that's really at the heart of thinking about the future as well. Like, I think a lot of us feel uh, frustrated. I know a lot of young people feel very frustrated with the way that the planet has been uh, exploited. The obviousness that the capitalism's becoming hostile to life. Um, and you know, it's funny because in Australia we talk a lot about real estate and I think it's kind of a metaphor for climate change. Like people are really worried that they can't buy a house. 
but actually half the city's going to be underwater, so like, who gives a shit if you can buy a house? Like, put it in perspective. Yeah. Um, sorry, I think that went a little bit off no, the no, question. No, no, <laughs> it's all absolutely relevant. Um, Corey, I guess just your kind of range of interests, you know, you, you give a lot of talks, you, you've written fiction, non-fiction, you're very much engaged with um, technology and future, and um, yeah. Could you talk a bit about yeah. throwing that in? So I think that when I was younger, I had a naive idea that uh, to be a writer was to cloister yourself and and write things that came from the whole cloth. That that you know your your imagination would visit you with with all of the raw material needed to to tell stories. And I, and I think that what I've actually found in my life is that the more engaged you are with other things, although it it does. It does put a lot of time pressure on you. It also provides you with the raw material to work with. So, you know, I'm a computer science professor at a university in the United Kingdom, and I'm a research affiliate with the MIT Media Lab. I own and uh, co-edit a website called Boing Boing that's a technology and culture website where I try to keep track of all the fragments of things that seem like they have some broader significance. And by sort of piecing all that stuff together, uh, it, it becomes research for a novel I don't know I'm writing until enough of it is accumulated to tell me what novel it's going to be. I find that to be a much more useful way than to imagine I know enough about a subject to know that it's got a novel in it, but not enough to write that novel. I, I think it's much more likely that I will discover a novel's worth of material out there in the world through a kind of directed random walk than, than that my kind of naive views about some subject that I don't really understand very well might someday gel up enough to turn into a book. That, that feels to me to be like a highly speculative enterprise, not suited to someone who is very time constrained. <laughs> um, we've, we've had the parent-child thing mentioned a couple of times, so I just want to draw that out a little bit. It's true that there is a, there's a parent-child relationship in your novel, and yet yeah, in all of them. Um, did you want to talk a little bit more, maybe about Sam's mother, Ivy, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, actually, I like Ivy a lot. I think um, she's probably my favourite character in this book, even though she's not the protagonist. Um, she works really hard and she does the best with what she's got, um, but she doesn't always make good long-term decisions because she's so stressed. Um, I think she's probably going to be familiar to a lot of women and men also. Um, but yeah, without... Uh, Without giving anything away, I think that um, Ivy and the strain in Ivy and Sam's relationship is a lot about um, taking responsibility and this kind of inability for either of them to take responsibility for the other. And it's not something that I wanted to illustrate or that I deliberately set out to do, but um, having written the book, looking back at it, I realised that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of threads of like abdication and abandonment in this book that, um, yeah, I think, like, my parents haven't abandoned me, they're right there, they're in, like, the fourth row, <laughs> they're very sweet, <laughs> but, um, but I think it was, yeah, it was something that thinking about the future and thinking about uh, one's responsibility to the future, uh, you, you inevitably think about the children in your life and how they're going to go in the world that they're going to inherit and you know the world that we're going to inherit from our parents and pass on so I guess that was a big part of it for me um it, yeah yeah Maya was that as you write books for children as well and was that sort of a driving force for you as well thinking about this world the children are going to inherit I guess it lies there automatically somehow uh, this is also very much a story about parents uh, wanting what is best for their yeah. children and they and and I have three kids myself so being a parent is obviously something I think a lot about and how difficult it is <laughs> and nice of course <laughs> but still <laughs> quite difficult uh, but all my three main characters they have really um, they think they know what is best for their kids uh, and they have everything sorted out for them uh, they have plans ready uh, but they, they forget that 
their children are very different persons from them and, and they are having uh, other plans and other hopes and um, so this is also very much a story about uh, how um, how difficult that part of, of the parent and child relationship can be and also uh, very much um, how do I say this? Well, children they change all the time, and when tr and and trying to to be a good parent is also trying to change with them somehow, and that is really difficult. Uh, and and the three main characters they sort of all of them. I mean, Tao she wants her son to be the chosen one and get education, because she's sort of she was sort of a uh, a smart child. Her son is more like he's he's. He's normal, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so she's pushing him all the time uh, and that's really, it's so sad because she doesn't really see him as the normal kid he is. And George, he wants his son to take over the farm. Um, so this is a, a classical story about, you know, uh, giving this, your son uh, the farm uh, in, a, in, a, in a better uh, a, a better farm than you've got yourself because it's a family farm and then it turns out that his 18 year old son wants something completely different different and they are really bad at communicating so this is sort of and it's devastating for for george and william he wants he has one son and eight daughters no seven daughters and they all he can see is this one son mm -hmm. and and their relationship is terrible and his son has some big problems that his father doesn't really understand uh, so for, for, for William's part it's more like trying to see his especially one of his daughters instead and see uh, see his girls so it's sort of also a feminist story I guess yeah I found um, all of the relationships very touching but um, yeah George and his son just had this very that was very realistic there was just something so realistic about that um, Cora, you do have the parent-child relationship, but I think the friendships and, and lovers in this book, those close relationships are really powerful in the book. Yeah, so the, the walkaways as like a culture, if they have a, a villain, it's not people, it's the, it's the sin of self-deception, of, of, of self-serving rationalization. And the reason that's their, uh, their greatest bugaboo is that they're living in a, a world of gross inequality, and gross inequality has a whole bunch of self-serving rationalizations that are its handmaidens. So if you have much more than everyone else, that's either a very unfair situation, or it's fair because there's something special about you, right? The only way that having more than everyone else can be fair is if you are special. And so that means everyone else has to be less special than you. And so that may be plausible. There are probably some people who are sort of Six Sigma geniuses or talents or what have you. But then when you arrive at this place where your children also have so much more than everyone else, well, then you start to become a eugenicist. Because if you're special and it's transmissible through your germ plasm, then you must not just be special, you must have special blood. You must have special gametes that are traveling in your bloodline. You start to, you know, you're sort of two steps away from the divine right of kings once you start to believe in heredit hereditary meritocracy. And so the, um, one of the protagonists of this novel is a woman whose father is very wealthy and who has projected onto her this eugenic specialness that she must have by dint of being in his bloodline. And then when she repudiates it all, it becomes a source of enormous anxiety to him, not just because he's worried that she'll be kidnapped and then held to ransom, or that um, she may be entitled to some chunk of the family fortune through their trust that she might squander or endanger or some other thing, but because it strikes at the very core of his identity. And he has this very poisonous love for her that expresses itself in this very controlling, uh, way, you know, he's very rich, so he hires private eyes to follow her around. When she gets into trouble, he pays to have her record expunged. When she goes underground, he hires mercenaries to kidnap her so that he can retrain her and, and show her what her true destiny is and so on. And all through it, it's a, it's a not entirely un, uh, unadulterated 
uh, emotion, right? There's, there is somewhere buried in this super toxic, bad, evil stuff, there's, there's, there's love, which, in, you know, spoiler alert, in the end, becomes part of his own crisis, his own journey, that, that he never stops feeling something that's beyond this, this sense of identity. And meanwhile, she's gone off and found loads of people to stand in for a parental figure for her, as the, as the old saying goes, Oedipus, Oedipus, as long as he loves his mother. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so in the form of lovers and mentors and so on, um, and, and has to kind of recreate her own parental relationships with them too. And I'm also a parent, I'm traveling with my 10 year old, if you see a, me with a young girl tomorrow who's like performatively holding me in contempt, you'll, you'll, you'll have met my daughter. Uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, it's right on schedule. When she was born, her godfather, a science fiction writer named Bruce Sterling, and is, you know, sort of the most hip and bohemian dude I know, said, the one thing you need to know is that by the time she reaches adolescence, it doesn't matter how outre and kind of countercultural you are, you will epitomize contemptible bourgeois normalcy for her. <laughs> and certainly, like, confronting that in my own family life has kind of oozed into my fiction as well. <laughs> um, so we had a reading from my... Um It'd be great to get a bit of a taster of um, your books as well, Jen and Corey, um, before we get towards audience question time. Um, Jen, do you mind um, reading? And we can talk a little bit about the idea of hope, I think, out of these readings as well. All right. I don't know about hope. People keep telling me this is bleak. I'm like, honey, I haven't hope started. <laughs> this isn't bleak. I can go bleaker. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the cover of this book, which is very beautiful, is a cuttlefish. Um, I don't know, a lot of South Australians are familiar with the uh, breeding aggregation of cuttlefish that happens up at Wyala, and I was lucky enough to go and um, snorkel with them last year, and I'm going to go back this year because uh, I'm in love with them. I wrote an essay about it, which is going to be in the next Overland, um, in which I lock eyes with a cuttlefish. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye out for that one. The cuttlefish breeding season hadn't lasted long, three weeks, a month at most. When it was over, some of the scientists remained. They were finding other things to study now. They were looking for causes or effects. Residual petrochemicals, heavy metals, acidification, algae, deoxygenation, damage to the seagrass. The warming they were seeing should not have been happening this far south. Oceans absorbed the bulk of industrial toxins, and that meant the life in them did too. Fish were being tested for pharmaceuticals, rare metals now. The ones they caught themselves were no longer considered safe. But there was nothing they could point to, no single source to blame. It was all interconnected. If the cuttlefish were dying, their bodies were vanishing into the sea, which swallowed everything, even the evidence. Sam began another drawing, trying to make her clumsy lines obey her will. The idea of fate seemed so outdated, a comfort belonging to another time, like putting the earth at the centre of the universe and saying people were chosen by God or whoever to lord it over nature. That was childish, wishful thinking. It belonged in the past. If what she saw were warnings, then she must be free. Nothing was inevitable. She could choose a way forward. She shaded the animal's mantle. Everything was connected, so that idea was just as expedient. Free will was only the fact of pain demanding meaning. More likely, it was all just random noise. There was a third possibility. Those articles, those studies, when she thought back over all the tests they'd done, surely they should have found something. But there wasn't any evidence to show her brain could do anything special. It should be obvious, they were just hallucinations, delusions, dreams. That's what idiopathic perceptual disorders meant. It meant she was crazy. There would be comfort in that, another surrender. When she thought of that migraine, the flat still sea, all those bodies lying out along the sand, her mind slipped on the surface of a dream, a nightmare. It would be easier if it was all in her head. Yeah, so I think in that part, it's like the line between hope and denial. It's, a, it's when she's trying... And it's really horrible because you already know it's going to go badly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like she's trying to convince herself what she's seeing could just be 
a hallucination or when, you know, deep down she knows there's reality. Yeah, and she, but she doesn't always know as well. Like she's looking for a, a narrative that will match her experience and that narrative has not been handed to her. Um, so she's got medical explanations and some like logical explanations but she doesn't have a story that matches her experience of the world um, and part of part of my work writing this I was thinking a lot about um, the experience of friends and relatives with mental illnesses and uh, non-neurotypical experiences of the world and um, not everyone has this easy kind of uh, match between the reality that they're told is around them and the reality that they experience it's just yeah amazing the way you use you've got her mind you've got the world and the way that you do things with time you're also there's this sort of inner outer thing going on I'm not describing it very well but yeah <laughs> no it's, it's a deliberately disorienting book because yeah. I wanted to give the reader that experience as yeah. well of being a little bit lost in time and so this title dyschronia which means time sickness in the same way dyslexia means spelling sickness um, it's it's deliberately sort of really disorienting and I think that's why I get so many complaints from friends who've read it who are like, it made me dizzy, I feel nauseous. Yeah. <laughs> so apologies, I was telling, I think I should tell my publisher to put a little slip of side effects in the back. It's, it, it does sort of burrow in but in a very, I think in a very beautiful way. It gets people yeah. in the autonomic nervous system. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a layered kind of reading experience. Corey, would you like to read Chelsea? Sure. Uh so in this scene, uh, one of the protagonists, the, the, the once was rich girl who's been living among the walkaways and has become a, uh, a sort of proper radical cadre, has gone off with relief supplies to the remains of the, of the walkaway university, the breakaway scientific colony where they're working on this practical immortality, uh, which has just been firebombed uh, or, or destroyed by a hellfire missile. And they've, they've moved into a, a rammed earth shelter, underground shelter, where they're completing this work and they're getting along with it and she's living with them uh, when mercenaries come in uh, to, to finish the job. And being scientists and having been traumatized by watching their colleagues roast alive, they have rigged up all kinds of horrible booby traps and they catch the mercenaries. Uh, and then they decide that they have this nifty technology to park your metabolism maybe indefinitely. They're not sure because they haven't had a, an indefinite period of time to try it. And they figure rather than kill these two, they'll just they'll just uh, put them in a kind of cold sleep called deadheading. And uh, they're kind of divided on this. There are people who say that this is a moral Rubicon that having crossed, they'll never be able to come back from. Uh, and uh, she is watching them as they as they put these two mercenaries into uh, an infinite sleep. Deadheading was easier than she'd expected. Tabs, taps fitted to their IVs, the infographic showing their metabolism spinning down until it was barely distinguishable from death. That's what the fuss is about. But these, but these two were their crew, so they're putting two of their own into a, a cold sleep as well because they don't know how to, how to heal them. They're hoping later they'll have access to better medicine. But these two were their crew, comatose, no prospect of recovery. The mercs, she hadn't learned their names, though she thought others had, because they were thorough, were capable of walking it on their own. Would it be worse to put them in uh, to, to put them into suspended animation than to kill them? What kind of fucked up ethics put execution on a higher moral plane than pausing out someone's life? The low ceiling was claustrophobic. All the people crammed in together. Some of them are spies. It was only logical. Some of them think I'm a spy. Also logical. Underground living left her in a state of drifting unreality and unmoored circadians. She'd probably missed sleep or slept too much. She was often surprised to discover that she was gnawingly hungry. Sure, she'd just eaten. The mercs waited on their hospital beds, infographics regular. They'd been unshrink wrapped and sluiced clean of shit, tucked under white sheets, they were deep under the kind of general anesthetic trusted by paranoid walkaway university survivors. They scanned the man first. It was fast. They wheeled over the woman, the one, with, the one who'd spoken, the one who told them to just get it over with. She had parents, people who loved her. 
every human was a hyper-dense node of intense emotional and material investment, speaking meant that someone had spent thousands of hours cooing to you. Those lean muscles, that ringing tone of command, their inputs were from all over the world, carefully administered. The Merc was more than a person. She was like a spaceship launch. Her existence implied thousands of skilled people, generations of experts, wars, treaties, scholarship, and supply chain management. Every one of them was all that. She felt vertigo. What business had the walkaways thinking that they'd just wing it when it came to civilization? The Zodas, that's the super rich, the Zodas weren't anyone's friend, but they had an interest in the continuation of the civilization whose apex they occupied. These scientists, these weirdos and jobless slackers weren't qualified to run a planet. They were proud of their lack of qualifications. It was plausible that they were harvesting, it was plausible when they were harvesting feedstock and putting up buildings and cooking for each other. Now they were putting a stranger's body in a machine that was supposed to record her mind and they were going to bring her body to the brink of death. They did it without law, without authority, without regulation, without permit. They were winging it. Um, we do have time for questions now, and we've got a microphone in the middle there um, that you just have to line up at, and I've got some other questions if not. Um, can we ask if we could alternate between women, non-binary folk, men and non-binary folk? You can sort yourselves there, um, and make sure it's a question, not a statement. And not a two-part well. question, and not a, two and not a rambling a three statement part. followed by what do you think of that, which is technically a question, but not a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, you get the point. Um, microphone's there, and we do have someone coming up straight away. No? Oh. Yes. Cool. Hello. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I was just wondering, it's to all three of you, um, are you hopeful for the future, given the, the different things that you are writing about? Thank you. I am a hell of a lot more hopeful than my writing suggests. Um, <laughs> Mostly because I think that the best uh, technology that we have available to us is our culture and that we adapt uh, quickly to different situations. Um, I think the thing that human beings are best and worst at is empathy. Uh, and I would, like, I would like to think that writing does something in expanding our empathy with a, a wider group of people than we are culturally, naturally trained to think as a small village, I think. but. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that because we have this technology of culture that we're going to be okay, or some of us are going to be okay, hopefully most of us. You guys? Well, um, I'm optimistic every second I am depressed the other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> others. Uh, but, but still, for me, I find meaning in writing about this as well. So the History of Bees is actually the first of a planned quartet. The second just recently was published in Norway and, and will, will be published here as well. Uh, and I'm writing on the third right now. So, so, so writing gives me some, some meaning and helps me out of the depression, I guess. Um, I think, I think, I mean, human beings will will be here but i'm kind of depressed uh f for other species uh so yeah that's the worst part of it i think how we take so many other lives <laughs> yeah well you know I, I call this an optimistic disaster novel uh in the <laughs> sense that it's a it's about a world where the crisis occurs and we rally and I, I was very much inspired by a book by Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell. Solnit's best known for coining the term mansplaining, he mansplained. Uh, but she wrote this wonderful history book, she's an historian by trade, about how uh, when you read the contemporaneous first person accounts of people's conduct during times of crisis, whether it's the Christchurch earthquake or the Haiti earthquake or the San Francisco Great Fire, although people remember from a, from a, a time distance or across a spatial distance, they, they think they know that there were all these acts of barbarism and looting and people turning on one another. The people who lived through that experience it as the moment in which the kind of refrigerator hum of petty background grievance stops, and in the ringing moment of clarity afterwards, you realize your solidarity with everyone else. 
So, and then the cups show up. And then, they, well, and that's what she writes about. She writes about this idea of elite panic, right? Yeah. The, the conviction on the part of the people who wouldn't rush to everyone else's aid, that everyone is coming for them, mm -hmm. who preemptively deploy guard labor to prevent uh, to prevent that that uh, re retributive justice they're sure is on their way. So I I think that like it is not optimistic to design a system on the assumption that it'll never fail, right? If you're an engineer and you build a system on the assumption that it'll never fail, you're not an optimist, you're a fool. That's how we built the Titanic, right? That the optimistic view, or at least the hopeful view, is that when things break down, rather than exploding in a kind of ball of shrapnel, mm -hmm. that they'll roll to a graceful stop and then we'll all put our shoulders into getting them started again. You know, I, I don't think that we can predict the future, thankfully. I think the, the future depends on what we do. And I think optimism and pessimism are foundationally about predictions, right? Optimism, the prediction things will get better. Pessimism, the prediction things will get worse. Hope is the idea that in some stepwise fashion, in some modest way, you can improve your situation. And from there, you'll gain a new vantage point from which you may see an opportunity to improve your situation further still. And that rather than having to have a plot from A to Z, that gets us from here to fully automated luxury communism, that instead, we can find a thing we can do that makes the situation just this much better. And from there, something else might occur because the first casualty of every battle is the plan of attack. So if we waste a lot of time planning out A to Z, by the time we get to C, we'll have to start over again anyway. So we might as well just proceed in this stepwise fashion. And that's, that's hope. You know, when the Titanic sinks, the reason you tread water is not because you have any reasonable expectation of being rescued, but because everyone who was ever rescued treaded water until rescue arrived. That's hope, not optimism. It's the necessary but insufficient precondition for a better world. Thank you. Hi, uh, just a quick one for Corey. Uh, which came first, the idea or names for Hubert, Hubert etc., or the names for your daughter, Posey? <laughs> so my daughter is called Posey Emmeline Fibonacci Nautilus Taylor Doctorow. Uh, <laughs> and and um, I have a friend, actually, lives in Melbourne now, who named his son a, a large and lovely number of names. And I, I come from a, a family of um, refugees. My grandmother was a child soldier, uh, and then uh, she uh, deserted and met my grandfather, who was also in the army. He deserted, they moved to Canada, and so on. And all of my family have lots of names. They have a Russian name, a Hebrew name, a Yiddish name, an anglicized name. Often in addition to an anglicized version of their name, they have another name that was given to them because that was considered too old country. So my grandfather was Avram, so he's also Abraham. But when he got to Canada, his first boss said, that's too Russian, we'll call you William, so, or Bill. <laughs> Uh, and so having all these names, is it's, it's a kind of nice thing. And I think that we used to have a lot of fluidity in the names we called ourselves. We had nicknames and so on. And after 9-11, it was really interesting. People started going to official lengths to change their names. They went to deep polls and so on. Um, and there was this question like, is everyone changing their name after this crisis? And it wasn't that everyone was changing their name. It was that using a name that wasn't legally yours had become incredibly fraught. And so I thought, you know, middle names, they're, they're secrets. You get them for free. You can put as many as you want between the first and last name. And you don't have to use any of them. But if you do, no one can tell you that's not really your name. So we chose all of these middle names. I had so many more. We had a spreadsheet. Uh, but uh, with that, we, we netted out on about five. I, I also, if we'd had two, I wanted to give them both the same name a bunch of times, a different name once, and the same name a bunch of times. So like Sally, 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 Mary, Sally, 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 Sally. And the other one would be the same, but with a different number of Sally's on either side of the Mary, so that they would never be accurately represented in databases, and they would always be mixed up. <laughs> I also wanted to put a MySQL code injection attack in my daughter's name, but my, my wife said we couldn't have any curly braces or other exotic punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost inspired to go and add some you know, oh, more middle names. Do it. Name. Do it. Yeah. Abkadeki Dukmanakwit Stuvixes, which is the alphabet, and you can go by Abby for short. That's a really good one. <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, that about brings us to time, um, and it's been an absolute pleasure. And please go and buy these wonderful authors' novels, have a chat, get them signed, um, and enjoy the rest of Adelaide Writers Week. Thank, Thank you. you.